After watching the first weekend of the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament, I've got to say, there is no legitimate competition remaining for South Carolina. You are Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks Podcast. I'm Angel Lyon, the host of this podcast, and also the lead publisher for Gamecock Digest over on Fan Nation. Thank y'all so much for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your first listen or watch for your team here today. We are free and available, as always, both wherever you get your audio podcasts daily and also on YouTube. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more as new customers can join today and get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. The second round of the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament has officially concluded. We got to see the majority of the tournament action over the past few days and we all know, of course, that the South Carolina Gamecocks just steamrolled Presbyterian and North Carolina in their two respective matchups. But when looking at some of the other big names in the NCAA tournament, I don't think that South Carolina has any reason to worry about the rest of the field. We're going to start off today's show with that, and we're also going to talk about how Dow Loggins is helping Lenore Sellers and why Michi Johnson leaving South Carolina and going into the portal might be leaving some mixed emotions. We'll touch on all that on today's edition of Locked on Gamecocks. But let's start off with, again, how South Carolina's competitors have performed in the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament. Because it's not been a good weekend for a lot of these teams. Even the teams that have moved on for the most part, those teams were not impressive, and I'm about to run through a whole litany of examples of different squads that, going into the tournament, you could say maybe it could have been a challenger for South Carolina, but up to this point right now, they don't look like they could contend with South Carolina if they played them at this very moment. Let's start off with two-seed Stanford who had to go to overtime in the round of 32 to defeat Iowa State at home, by the way. Number three seed UConn, they had to thwart off a late game comeback from Syracuse in their home arena to win by just eight points in the second round yesterday evening. Number two seed UCLA, they won by just four points against Creighton in the round of 32, you can see where I'm going with this, on their own home floor. LSU, probably the most disappointing team out of all the teams on the top four seed lines. They only defeated the 14-seeded Rice Owls by 10 points in the first round, and then struggled against number 11 seed Middle Tennessee. Matter of fact, they were losing just a couple minutes into the second half of that game on Sunday. The Iowa Hawkeyes, the fighting Caitlin Clarks, had the lowest margin of victory out of all the number one seeds this past weekend against a number 16 seeded team in Holy Cross. I believe that final port margin was 26 or 29 points. And then they played West Virginia on Monday night and quite frankly escaped. They won that game by only 10 points. And as a lot of people would point out, a big reason why was because of the free throw shooting disparity that existed in that contest. You look at Southern Cal. They struggled to pull away against Kansas last night in their round of 32 matchup. And obviously look at their team. Over half of their points on average come from just three players. The star player in that group obviously being true freshman Juju Watkins. And then the last team I'll bring up real quickly is Notre Dame, who won by just 14 points against a number 15 seed team in Kent State in the first round on Saturday. 
So you get my overall point here. A lot of these teams, whether it was their first round game or their second round game or both games, they did not do a great job of putting their opponent away. The only team this entire weekend out of all the top seeded teams that actually accomplished that feat was South Carolina. And it's kind of emblematic of what has been the case throughout this entire season in women's college basketball. South Carolina has been a constant. They have been number one in the country now basically since the second or third week of the regular season, while there has been a revolving door of teams behind them in the number two spot, three spot, and four spot in the Associated Press poll. And we're now starting to see that carry over into the NCAA tournament in terms of the parity and in a lot of cases the instability with some of these other top contenders for the national championship. And so while on our Monday show, I did give y'all three teams that I thought could challenge South Carolina, at least three big challengers. I named Texas, Tennessee, and UCLA. I, I'm going to take back what I said. Right now, maybe outside of Texas, the team I've been the most impressed with outside of South Carolina out of all those top teams, there is not a single team out there right now that should scare South Carolina. That includes LSU. That includes Iowa with Caitlin Clark. Because South Carolina, as I think they have proven to this point, South Carolina's a different team this year than they were last year. Does that mean that they're invincible? No, it doesn't. There is a formula to beat them. But the thing is, the formula for South Carolina is the equivalent of a super long calculus equation at a college-level course, or in a college-level course. While the equation to beating a lot of these other top teams is more so your algebraic equations at the high school level. That's the gap between South Carolina and all of these other teams right now. It's just that large. So, does it mean that you can write off any of these teams? It doesn't mean that you should just go ahead and pencil in South Carolina as the national champions. Again, we all saw that that's not always going to play out that way. But, right now... It is 100% fair to say that Don Staley and the Gamecocks, they have no real threat in this tournament that could actually knock them off. Not a single one. So, it'll be interesting to see if that changes maybe this next weekend as we begin to see a lot of the top teams in each individual regional take on one another in the Sweet 16 and the Elite 8. Now, we haven't talked football in a little bit, and obviously the biggest storyline right now with South Carolina's football team, outside of them trying to get back on track in 2024, is Lenore Sellers. Redshirt freshman quarterback, looks to be the starter for next year, and offensive coordinator Dow Loggins, based on what Lenore Sellers said at his Monday presser with the media He's doing a really good job of managing his young quarterback and likely the successor to Spencer Rattler. And I'll explain why in just a couple moments right here on Locked on Gamecocks. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to Busted Brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a number one seed going all the way, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Sweet 16 action will begin on Thursday, and FanDuel's got a prop bet right now where you can Put money down on which game will see the biggest blowout in terms of the margin of victory. The best odds right now are going on the UConn versus San Diego State game, where the odds are listed at plus 160. Clemson versus Arizona is the next highest odd in terms of blowout at plus 200. 
20. So you can look at that prop bet and plenty of others right now on FanDuel. All you got to do is just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience is what brings home the winning trophy and also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, and LED headlights, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Dot com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit is only available to U.S. customers. Welcome back to this Tuesday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. We cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. The Locked On College Basketball Bracket Breakdown Show is now available on the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, where experts Andy Patton and Isaac Shea break down their brackets and discuss everything that you need to know about filling out a winning bracket and prepare for this year's NCAA Tournament. Find the Locked On Bracket Breakdown now on the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts daily. Offensive coordinator Dow Loggins has got an interesting situation on his hands at the quarterback position this offseason. With Spencer Rattler now walking out the door, South Carolina will be fielding a new starting quarterback for the first time in three seasons. And the favorite in many's eyes is Lenore Sellers, a redshirt freshman quarterback that got some sparse playing time this past fall. Obviously made a bunch of highlight reel-esque plays. And if that is indeed the case, of course, Dow Loggins, I think, is handling the transition the best way possible in terms of getting his young quarterback ready to be the starter for South Carolina. Lenore Sellers indicated this when he talked to the media on Monday afternoon. So I'm going to play a couple of clips and sound bites for y'all where Lenore Sellers dives into sort of what Dow Loggins is trying to teach him and preach to him in the film room and obviously on the practice field. So here's the first clip where Lenore Sellers talks about the expectations that he is setting for himself. Lenore, do you have... Do you put pressure on yourself? Do you have your own expectations that you feel you need to meet? Or is this just, hey, I'm just going to get better and believe in what I trust and what I know how to do? I do have expectations for myself. Um, I try not to make the same mistake twice. So I try to keep learning, making new mistakes. That's that's what D'Lo would say or tell me to do. Just not do the same thing and go backwards. Just make new mistakes and basically learn from them and go forward. Keep going forward. Now, in this second clip and soundbite, Lenore Sellers talks about the one thing that Dow Loggins is harping on the most when it comes to his development. What is the number one thing Dow Loggins tries to instill in you during film and practice sessions? Pretty much, let's see what something he'd say. Be firm, my decision making. Don't second guess. Like I said earlier, um, that was one thing last year. I was just always jerky like, if that makes sense. Like I see something and I hesitate and then I'd be late because I still try to make it. So you just like, if you make a decision, just stick with it. Whenever you have got a player like Lenore Sellers, who is very talented, obviously, but also quite young, and he is transitioning into an expanded role on his team, in this case at the quarterback position for South Carolina's football team, The best way to handle trying to get an athlete like that ready for their new role and ready to be the guy is to make sure that you do not put a ton of pressure on him, which Dal does not have to do because that's already happening with just all the outside noise that Lenore Sillis probably hears every single day 
no matter how hard he tries to block it out. Let's just call it like it is. A lot of South Carolina football fans feel like that Lenore Sellers has the potential to be one of the best quarterbacks, if not the best quarterback, to ever play at South Carolina. And heck, I have gone over some comparisons for Lenore Sellers. He's got traits that resemble a Cam Newton when he played at Auburn. He has got a little bit of K.J. Jefferson in him as well. And Lenore Sellers, he is somebody that, you know, based on the way that he's answering these questions at these pressers, you can tell that he is a very laid back sort of even kill guy. He is not somebody that at least on the outside is going to put a lot on himself. And that is something that is vital in his development because obviously, you know, you've got some people that have being a perfectionist as a personality trait. And when you're a perfectionist, obviously you want everything to be 100% right on the dot. Dot your I's, cross your T's, all that. But the danger of having that kind of personality is when something does go wrong. And as we all know with life, whether it is professionally, socially, personally, at some point in time, something is going to go awry. Something is going to not go your way, whether it was something you could control or something that was out of your control. And so for someone like Lenore Sellers, who was going to have a two-ton weight of expectations on his shoulders heading into next year, the fact that his position coach and his offensive play caller in Dow Lawkins is making sure to let him know, hey, listen, it is okay for you to make mistakes. That's why we're out here right now. That's what film study is for. Because nobody is ever perfect at quarterback. Even great quarterbacks like a Tom Brady or maybe a Joe Montana, a Patrick Mahomes. None of those guys have ever been perfect at practice or in a scrimmage or in a game day in and day out over the course of a major stretch in their career. What matters is your process and how you address problems when they do arise. Essentially, nip it in the bud when it shows up. Don't let it become a bad habit of yours. And that is something that Dow Loggins would know better than anybody on that coaching staff, considering all the time that he has spent in the NFL and how important it was for quarterbacks to approach the game the right way. And so. Hearing Lenore Sellers say this at this press conference on Monday, I think as a Gamecock fan, you should be quite optimistic about how the relationship between Dow Loggins and Lenore Sellers is continuing to build. Because we all saw with Dow Loggins that he can inherit great quarterback talent like Spencer Rattler, and he can utilize them to the best of his ability and basically get the most out of it. Now... Dow Loggins has a chance to mold a quarterback in his own image, develop a quarterback. He's not inheriting some five-star talent that's already played a couple years of college ball. He's got a kid that's got a ton of potential, but he still needs to be molded like he's a piece of clay. So, with all that being said, I think that that is a great sign of how all that is going between Lenore Sellers and Dow Loggins as far as setting expectations go and making sure that, again, he knows, look, we don't expect you to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes. Embrace that and make sure that you approach correcting those mistakes the right way at the same time. Now, while that was some good news that South Carolina got on Monday afternoon, Gamecock fans were not treated to positive news later on that evening as it was reported by On3 Sports' Joe Tipton that Michi Johnson is expected to enter the transfer portal. News that I think is going to bring mixed emotions for pretty much every single Gamecock fan. So we're going to examine both sides of that coin and also explain how this impacts South Carolina's basketball roster now looking at next season. We'll dive into all of that in a few moments right here on Locked on Gamecocks. 
Today's show and this week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest. Just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. The Iowa State Cyclones can only be described as a Nissan Pathfinder. They've been thrilling to watch and have really created a lane for themselves, entering the tournament as one of the hottest teams in the country. They have a date with Illinois this Thursday in the Sweet 16. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Welcome back to today's edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your team every single day in just 30 minutes. Michi Johnson has entered the transfer portal, and I have to admit personally, um, I was very surprised when this news came out early on Monday evening. Now, obviously at this point, especially for South Carolina fans who now probably know better than almost any other fan base in college sports, uh, what it's like to be hurt by portal departures I'm sure that this move is going to bring some mixed emotions for a lot of Gamecock fans. I know, obviously, there's fans on the extreme on both sides, but I do think that a lot of Gamecock fans are actually somewhere in the middle. So I want to sort of dissect both sides of this entire situation, of this sort of contrasting blend of feelings here in the next couple of minutes. So... Let's start off with the good with Michi Johnson and what all he did here. Because listen, Michi Johnson's contribution should not be diminished simply because it appears that he is not going to be back with South Carolina next season. First of all, Michi Johnson was one of the first players that fully believed in Lamont Paris's vision when he took the job at South Carolina two years ago. That first season that he spent with the team, the 2022-23 season, this team endured a lot of tough moments. Two 40-plus point blowout losses to Tennessee, only won 11 games, lost a ton of close games, which as a lot of people saw looking back retrospectively was an indication that this next season was going to be a great one. For South Carolina. And Michi Johnson, look, he flirted with going to the NBA, went through the combine, had some good moments in some of those games, but got some feedback where, you know, he was told he needed to get better in certain aspects. So he returned to Columbia and he got better this past season. He saw his points per game total go up, rebounds per game total go up, his shooting percentage went up, I think, a whole three percentage points. And turnovers went down by, I believe, almost 20. And while, yes, he might have not been the primary ball handler like he was the previous year, that's still pretty doggone good for how much Michi Johnson got the basketball throughout the season. And there's a couple of games where if Michi Johnson did not go off, South Carolina very well could have found themselves on the losing end of things. Those games that I'm referring to include games against Mississippi State at home. Also, a game against Texas A&M on the road. And then a home win against Florida where Michi Johnson hit clutch shot after clutch shot in the final two minutes to put South Carolina over the top at the very end. You cannot take any of that away from Michi Johnson. He believed in Lamont Paris. When, quite frankly, at the time, there wasn't a lot of great reasons for people to believe in Lamont Paris, considering the situation that he was entering. So you cannot discount any of that. Now, in terms of why this move might be confusing for a lot of people, and also for some fans, they might feel a bit hurt. And I know it sounds maybe a bit childish saying that, but obviously, again, fans build massive, massive relationships with these sports teams. And especially with South Carolina fans, you know better than anybody. You bleed garnet and black. So when someone does leave, it does hurt. It feels like a family member has left. So now let's break that side of things down. 
Michi always referred to his relationship with Lamont Paris and always seemed to convey that his relationship with Lamont Paris was quite strong. Again, Lamont is probably the reason why he ever came to South Carolina. And so when you have a great relationship with your head coach, it's a bit surprising when a guy decides to go into the portal. Also, Michi Johnson clearly loved South Carolina. This was a guy that would go to women's basketball games. Heck, he was just seen the other day at one of the baseball games the Gamecocks played against Vanderbilt. Sporting events that if he really didn't want to go to any of them, nobody would probably even really notice. Like, no one would hold that against him. But yet, he did that. And that is an indication of somebody that really loves the school and is trying to support other athletic programs. And so when you have someone that does that and then they turn around and now they're leaving, it just makes it all the more head scratching. Now, the rumor mill right now is saying that Ohio State is heavily involved here. It seems like that this does involve some NIL-related conversations. And that leads me to a part where I I think I'm going to probably get some blowback for this, but you know what? I'm going to just go ahead and say it. This is the absolute truth. Assuming Michi Johnson goes back to Ohio State, where he did play for two seasons, and it is in his home state, assuming he goes back to play for the Buckeyes, the truth is this. Michi Johnson will just be another guy at Ohio State, historically speaking, and in terms of how he will be remembered. He will be. The only way in which that won't happen is if Michi Johnson basically goes into Superman mode and leads Ohio State onto a massive, just deep NCAA tournament run this next season. If he does something like that, okay, then they'll remember you for the rest of time. Otherwise, He is just going to be another name that played for the Buckeyes. If he had decided to not go pro and he decided to not go into the portal and stay at South Carolina instead, Michi Johnson had a chance to cement himself as one of the Gamecock faithful's favorite players of all time when it comes to men's basketball. And for a lot of Gamecock fans, it will always be all love for Michi Johnson. I'm not trying to indicate or say otherwise. My point here is it just won't be the same because he left. I'm going to use an example that actually looks the other Carolina, North Carolina. Armando Baycott and R.J. Davis, those two guys are like fourth-year or even fifth-year seniors now. Both guys at multiple junctures in their college career have probably had a chance to go ahead and leave UNC and go on to the NBA, play professional basketball, or at least take their chance. And instead of doing that, both of those guys have come back every single year. Now, yes, North Carolina is a bigger brand in men's basketball than South Carolina is. And yes, I'm sure they got more money than South Carolina. I get all of that. But here's my point that I'm getting at here. Armando Baycott and R.J. Davis both seem to understand that realistically, long term, they are probably not going to be playing the NBA for several years. Obviously, they would love that, but that's likely not going to happen. And they also, from my standpoint, seem to understand that one day the ball is going to stop bouncing for them and their careers are eventually going to end. That is the circle of life with these athletes. Eventually, one day, you're going to be done, whether you choose to be done and retire or not. And you got to have another plan when that eventually happens, whenever that day comes. And for a lot of these guys that play college ball and wound up never playing at the professional level, something that matters big time is your relationship with your school. 
the school where you likely spent at least two, three, four years, where more than likely for a lot of these guys, hopefully you have gotten a degree and therefore you're part of the school's alumni base. And if you've stayed there long enough, guess what? There are going to be certain people high up, by the way, that look after you, that make sure that you're not going to be in trouble. You're not going to have a hard time finding a landing spot in terms of just having a job. Not every alumni has that luxury, but some of these student athletes, they do get that luxury depending on if they stay at one spot long enough. But in the transfer portal era, we're seeing that a lot less. And I feel like that that is something that, quite frankly, a lot of these guys just don't think about. Now, that's not to hold that against Michi. There could be several reasons why he is leaving South Carolina that maybe we don't know about. And maybe we don't need to know about because maybe it is something that is heavily embedded into his personal life. Don't know. Just saying that if Michi had stayed at South Carolina... He could have gone down as one of the all-time favorite Gamecocks to have ever played here, considering the relationship he had with the school and with the program. And again, that's not to say now Gamecock fans are just going to dislike him for the rest of his life. Not saying that. But it does change the relationship. It does. It will never feel the same now because this has happened. So... Long story short, let's talk about the impact for Lamont Paris and the team. Where does this leave this team? Well, now Lamont's got to replace his entire starting backcourt. Talon Cooper, obviously, again, graduated, eligibility all exhausted. Now, Michi Johnson in the transfer portal. You just lost one of your most athletic playmakers on this entire team. A guy that could shoot the three ball pretty well and also could drive to the basket and make plays happen through contact. You've got to find another guard like that in the portal. You don't have a guy right now in this roster that can do something like that at that kind of level. Jacoby can do some things like that, but not to the level of Amici Johnson. So you do have to find somebody that can help make up for all that. And again, already gone over a couple of guards that the team has kind of contacted in the portal. So we'll just have to see where all those conversations can end up for South Carolina over the next couple of weeks. But Lamont Paris, look, he did great in the portal last year. And after what happened this season, I'm sure that he's going to bring in another great crop of future Gamecocks that are going to help this team stay relevant and not fall back into the abyss like the team did after that Final Four run in 2017. So, with that being said, that's going to do it for today's edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. Hope that y'all thoroughly enjoyed today's show as always. What are y'all's thoughts on the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament? Do you feel like it's basically South Carolina's to lose with how everybody else has been playing so far? What are your thoughts on Dow Loggins and how he is helping Lenore Sellers come along as the team's likely next starting quarterback in their offense? And lastly, what are your thoughts on B.G. Johnson entering the transfer portal? No matter what your thoughts are, let me know down below in the comments section if you watch today's show on YouTube or you can shoot me a direct message on X at a line underscore SC if you listen to today's show on an audio podcast app. As always, thank y'all so much for tuning in. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, and I'll be sure to catch y'all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast.